you on the water and in the field, Cornell Cooperative Extension's news magazine show. I'm your host, Kim Barber. We're coming to you today from the Shinnecock Indian Powwow. The powwow is one of the largest Native American gatherings on the East Coast. This weekend is filled with drums, dancing, and celebration of Native culture. There are numerous Native American arts, crafts, and food vendors from near and far. The powwow is designed to bring an opportunity for learning about the cultures of Native American Indians from all over the Americas. On today's show, we'll fly with the ospreys and learn about their comeback, visit them in their nest up close and personal, and talk to some folks that really care about seeing these magnificent creatures thrive. Then we'll go out to the bluffs of Long Island, learn about how they were formed and how we could protect them from erosion. Next, we're going to paint rain barrels with the Pecanic Estuary Program and the East End Arts Council at an event designed to teach people about the Pecanic Estuary and how to protect it. After that, we're going to cruise up and down Roanoke Avenue in Riverhead and learn about a major undertaking Suffolk County Department of Public Works took to improve the runoff system along this stretch of road. So hang on, and here we go. The osprey population was in decline in the 1950s and 60s due to DDT, a pesticide that poisoned the bird and thinned their eggshells, resulting in a low hatch rate. However, since the ban on DDT in the 1970s, the osprey is considered a conservation success story. Let's take a look at where the osprey population stands today. I'm Charles Eldermeyer. I'm the bird cams project leader here at the Lab of Ornithology. In my role, I do everything from the technical setup of bird cams, the communication planning, all that kind of stuff, as well as reaching out to find new cams that, to hopefully make people excited about watching birds. So the osprey, like many large raptors, uh, experienced significant population declines due to DDT. And uh, a very similar thing happened where DDT was causing their eggshells to thin. It was interfering with calcium in their bodies and so as a result of that you saw populations of ospreys crash. They also had issues with um, water. Clean water is needed to support the prey populations and so what you got was in the 1970s the Clean Water Act came through, Clean Air Act came through. These two things also combining with DDT disappearing from the landscape wound up resulting in a, in a hugely more beneficial environment for osprey populations to grow. And that's where we are today. The osprey has rebounded in great numbers and have become a common sight up and down the northeast coast. The fish is its main diet and to watch an osprey hunt is the picture of concentration and skill, diving into the water to catch its prey. Once captured, the osprey will position the fish head first to make it more aerodynamic until it returns to the nest. Ospreys pair for life, and you will start to see these raptors in early spring and stay until the fall. As a migratory bird, their home in the winter is Florida, the Caribbean, South America, and the Gulf Coast. Ospreys live from 15 to 20 years old, on average, and can rack up to 160,000 migration miles during its lifespan. Ospreys breed in the north, and they choose its nest according to its location to the water and usually come back to the same nest. Man-made structures are a favorite spot for the ospreys and you'll often see them on telephone poles, antennas, and nest platforms as well as in natural environments. The female lays around three eggs and they don't hatch all at once. The older hatchling dominates its younger siblings and often gets most of the food the parents bring. If the food is abundant, all the chicks receive the proper amount of food and they will live in relative harmony. Uh, many birds return to the same nest if they are successful, and ospreys are no different. Um, generally speaking, if they've been successful in a nest and if the nest is still there, it's much easier to refurbish a nest than it is to go and create a brand new one. And you'll see this through uh, many, especially big species, that invest a lot of time and energy in building a nest. They'll come back to those nests. However, if they fail, so meaning if, if they're not successful in raising their young to the point where they can fly away, sometimes that's enough to cause them to want to create a new nest somewhere else, almost like cleaning the slate, trying again somewhere new. But generally speaking, even that sometimes isn't enough to dissuade them from a good nest site. All of the images you have been seeing from the nest perspective was given to us by the Osprey Zone. 
Paul Henry started this webcam because of his love for the Osprey. I've always been just kind of fascinated with Ospreys uh, because of their relationship to the sea and the fishing and my love for the ocean. And, you know, being around these parts for all these years and seeing all these Ospreys coming and going from their nests, nobody really had a clue what was going on inside the nests until people started putting these cameras up. And, and when you see what's going on in the nest and you get this very raw picture into nature, I think any normal person is going to be incredibly attracted to that information, to that window. It, it, it's just a fascinating world that when people discover, they're, they're mo usually they're very, very attracted to. Um, you know, not only do people relate, I think, to the ospreys, but they love the fact that this family is struggling with nature and winning. On the Water and in the Field plans a full episode on the osprey in the near future. We will talk more to Charles Adelmeyer at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and Paul Henry from the Osprey Zone about the osprey, as well as other shorebirds we have in our area. So see you then. It's so great to see the osprey thrive. We're standing on the main grounds of the powwow. This is where all the festivities happen. A powwow has been hosted by the Shinnecock Nation for hundreds of years, but in 1946 it was revived to the public as a fundraiser for the Shinnecock Presbyterian Church and it hosts thousands of visitors every year. If you live on Long Island and have visited the North Shore, you have probably seen a bluff. We take a look at bluffs and become familiar with them and how important they are to our geology in our next story. Bays and oceans naturally captivate and draw humans near, as evidenced by the high degree of residential homes and business development along coastal shorelines. However, while our coastlines are beautiful, development on our shoreline does not come without a high level of risk. Bluffs are a coastal feature that are particularly vulnerable to catastrophic loss as their physical characteristics are prone to erosion caused by tidal scour, storm events, and land uses. Infrastructure on top of or on the bluff such as homes, porches, patios, stairways, pools, fences, and landscaping remain continuously threatened by bluff erosion. In an effort to protect property values and associated infrastructure, millions of dollars are invested each year to mitigate the catastrophic effects of erosion and stabilize these eroding bluffs. It is important to recognize that bluff erosion and catastrophic failure cannot be predicted or completely prevented. However, the good news is that there are a number of affordable and effective management practices property owners can employ to help reduce the risk of bluff erosion. Not only are these practices simple to implement, but they are the most cost-effective means to stabilize an eroding bluff. Reduce the risk of future failures, protect shoreline infrastructure, and maintain the value of your investments. Geologically, uh, the definition of a bluff is simply a uh, high embankment or headland that has a very steep slope. Uh, basically, what you have is, it's a pretty high feature in some areas, but it can range from uh, 9 feet high to over 120 feet, depending on where you are uh, along the shoreline. Uh, bluffs are not forming today, they're what we call relic features, because the processes that built them are no longer operating. These bluffs were, uh, are actually glacial features. They were formed over 20,000 years ago when the area was covered by ice. Uh, the ice stopped here for a while and it dumped all the material that it was carrying that it had scraped down from uh, Connecticut and points further north. And when it, when it left, when these receded, uh, it left everything from the boulders that you can see around me on the beach to fine clays and uh, silts that are found in the bluff. So you have a remarkably mixed type of material here most of it is unconsolidated, it's, not, it's loose, it's not held together by anything, so it's very easily erodible. And that's why we see the recession uh, of the bluff that we do today. Whether flanked by the Great Lakes, shaped by Long Island Sound, or buffering Cape Cod from oceanic waves, all bluffs share common features and characteristics which render them highly susceptible to erosion and innately unstable. 
Well, erosion is a natural process. It's just the interaction between primarily storm waves and water levels and the bluff. And it's been occurring since the bluffs have been here over the last 22,000 years. We can see where they have uh, receded. The rocks that you see out there actually used to be in the bluff. So you can get an idea of what's happening here is that the shoreline is retreating as sea level rises over the long term like it's been doing for the last 18,000 years. And then you can look up into the bluff and see some of these erratics up already are in the bluff now. But as the bluff erodes, they tend to roll down and they're left on the beach. Well, usually you can see, you can look down the coast here, and it's where you see an exposed face of the bluff. You don't have any vegetation on it. That indicates that something is going on. Then you have to take a look at, okay, exactly what's happening. The single most important factor affecting uh, bluff erosion here on Long Island is wave action, uh, particularly wave action at the toe of the bluff. It's the waves are the primary agent for picking up and removing material from the toe. And once they do that, they make the whole bluff face uh, unstable. Usually they undercut the bluff, you'll have a scarp. That's an unstable situation and the material will slide down the bluff face. That is the problem in the majority of real erosion issues we have on Long Island is that it's wave action at the toe of the bluff. And if you look at some of the vegetation, you can actually see that it, even though it's vegetated, it looks like that vegetation is moving because you can see tree trunks coming out at an angle. They're not vertical to the horizon. In the northeast, we have more nor'easters than we do hurricanes. We get about seven to 11 uh, nor'easters a year on average. During the storms, you usually have the water elevations uh, become higher than they are during the normal tidal cycles. So you have the storm tide, and that allows the water to get up to the toe of the bluff. So you have the water level at the toe of the bluff, and then the waves on top of that that can come in, and they pick up and remove the material and cause some of the most severe bluff erosion. As we have highlighted, bluff erosion is a natural and continuous process that can also be catalyzed and magnified by numerous forces, including human land use decisions. Here we share an example of property damage caused by bluff erosion over the last 50 years. We met up with a coastal property owner on the north shore of Long Island who was willing to share his story of the devastating effects of bluff erosion. I would say conservatively uh, three quarters of an acre. Three quarters of an acre worth right. of linear feet out. Exactly. Yep. So maybe 150 feet? Probably, yeah. So, and over how many years was that lost? Well, the house was built in 41. So what yeah. we're standing in right now is the basement and Correct. the garage. So I'm happy to say we have our original porch floor and I have a beautiful roof. It is very evident that bluff erosion can be very costly, not only from a financial perspective, but it can also take a strong and emotional toll. As you can see in this case where Jeff continues to watch his family home and property crumble due to forces of nature. Coastal erosion processes are well understood and research continues to advance. However, predicting when, where, and the magnitude of loss remains unfortunately unpredictable. In fact, the only prediction that can be made is that erosion will occur. If you would like more information on coastal bluff erosion and learn about how to maintain your bluff, please call the Suffolk County Soil and Water Conservation District at 631-852-3285 or visit www.suffolkswcd.org. Our Long Island Bluffs are spectacular. Thanks to the Suffolk County Soil and Water Conservation District for making this information available. Stormwater runoff can carry pollutants from land into the water, and one way we can protect our waterways is by using rain barrels. The Peconic Estuary Program hosted an event to help promote the use of rain barrels, and we'll check it out in our next story. The Peconic Estuary Program has partnered up with East End Arts Council and the town of Riverhead to bring this rain barrel painting event. Uh, it's an awareness event to have people realize that runoff affects all of the estuary, the Conic Estuary, the Conic Bays, but also the Conic River. And so what we're hoping to do is have these rain barrels placed around town and they will not only educate the public about the threats to the river and the estuary with uh, rainwater runoff, but they'll also serve the purpose of 
um, mitigating that runoff going into the river. So we'll be able to collect the water that's coming off of the rooftops and the other uh, parking lots and impervious surfaces around the town. And uh, then that water can be recycled and used in other ways rather than washing straight into the river um, un unfiltered and um, untreated. The Peconic Estuary Program is a partnership of all different levels of government along with citizens and scientists and business owners. Everyone who's affecting or affected by water quality in the Peconic Estuary. And the goal is to manage for water quality based on watershed boundaries rather than jurisdictional boundaries. So Cornell Cooperative Extension's Marine Program has been conducting the outreach and education for the Peconic Estuary Program. And um, all year long in this summer we've been um, out uh, talking with the public and educating citizens about the threats to the estuary. The Rain Barrel Program is an offshoot of our Homeowner Rewards Program where we encourage people to install green infrastructure practices on their private property. Rain barrels are great because they can store water so you reduce pumpage from the aquifer and you can reuse that water in your garden helping it to infiltrate back into the groundwater. It's, a, it's an important educational program. Rain barrels are a great way for everyone to get involved in protecting water quality at home. It's been a great partnership with the East End Arts Council and getting kids involved in painting these rain barrels because it's great to teach kids about protecting the environment. It's a real investment in our future because these kids will be someday protecting our estuary or making decisions at home every day that affect our estuary. So East End Arts is pleased to be collaborating with the Conic Estuary and Town of Riverhead Business Improvement District. We've invited Chris Dyer to be our artist in residence while he's here. So he's spending a few nights in our artist apartment. He's done a talk um, and showing his DVD and he did a talk in our, in our uh, one room schoolhouse talking about his history, his art. Kids art is kids art. Uh, there's no expectations. It's just about having fun, you know? Like, no one's expecting a kid to have technical mastery. They're just there to sort of like do something fun and express themselves and try out things. And if they really like it, they can keep on doing it if that's what they enjoy. So it's good to have places and chances for kids to do this because many don't and that's, uh, that's a big thing they could miss out on. You know, my life without art, would not be the same in life, and I'm grateful that in school they taught me, so happy to serve in this way too. One of the locations that a rain barrel was placed was at the famous Big Duck. Cornell Cooperative Extension staff and some folks from the Peconic Estuary were there tending a small rain garden as well. Peconic Estuary Program is here at the Big Duck today to maintain one of our rain gardens. It's a demonstration garden, and we have native plantings to try and trap the water when it rains so it doesn't turn into stormwater runoff. Now we're also here today to install this rain barrel, which we're going to put next to the building behind me. That way the rainwater can collect into the rain barrel, and then this way can minimize the amount of stormwater runoff. So now the overflow hose here, mm -hmm. we put it to the back, then if this barrel overflows, if there's too much rain, the rainwater can flow out the tube and down towards the rain garden. This is actually um, a native plant garden and it's all native species to Long Island and we put it here because these plant species need very little help. They don't need extra nutrients, they don't need extra water and they'll survive very well. And as the water rains and comes down through this garden, it will be filtered. So it reduces any sort of toxins or chemicals that the rainwater gathers along the streets before it enters the Peconic Estuary. And, and isn't the Peconic Estuary like right over here? Yeah, so there's fields behind me and some woods, but then just past that is right where the Peconic River lets out into the estuary, right by Riverhead Aquarium. While you are in and around Riverhead, look for some of the works of art that are now collecting rainwater. If you want to get involved with the Peconic Estuary Program, visit their website at www.peconicestuary.org. They do a lot of work to help protect the estuary. Speaking of work that protects our waters, in our next story we'll take a look at a stormwater project the Suffolk County Department of Public Works has been working on and the significance of this undertaking. As a part of the Suffolk County Stormwater Management Program, the Roanoke Project is one piece of many projects the county has that includes construction projects that make a difference in water quality. So Roanoke Avenue, it's, it's, a, it's a very busy road. It's heavily used not only in, in Riverhead from town, to the circle in the hospital, but it's also used by the ambulance companies coming from the South Fork to, to reach uh, the hospital in Riverhead here, Peconic Bay Medical Center. 
So it's a, it's a major artery. It's a very important, uh, heavily traveled artery. And because it's so heavily traveled and built so many years ago, the county decided a few years ago that they needed to uh, make the upgrades and to uh, improve the conditions on it. So the first improvement that was made was the drainage. All that uh, drainage was flowing. There was some backup issues, which caused flooding, of course, was a safety issue. And there was also uh, most of the uh, flow was into Merritt's Pond. So the county does drainage very well, and they, they provide for better treatment of that water to reduce pathogens and sediment flowing into Merritt's Pond. And eventually all that water gets finally goes into uh, you know Peconic Bay. It makes its way there. There's, a, there's an elaborate system of wetlands that eventually discharges into the bay. Any improvements made on this end is, is really positive. So the project starts out in the planning stages, moves forward to a conceptual design, uh, which is basically we figure out exactly what we're going to do on the project and how we're going to do it, and then moves forward from there through you know various design stages to eventually the final design. Um, where we put the project out to bid, select a contractor, and then move forward with the construction from there. And in this case, uh, the project ended up being a full reconstruction, which includes rehabilitating the asphalt surface, the, the roadway surface, the curbs, sidewalks, signage, pavement markings, traffic signals, and, and of course the drainage system, which uh, was really the, the main focus of the project because of the uh, you know, the water quality and also water quantity concerns, the uh, flooding issues. So Roanoke Avenue itself is a uh, little under a mile and a half. It spans from Main Street down in downtown Riverhead all the way up to the traffic circle at County Road 58, Old Country Road. In addition to that, there's adjacent town roads and of course lots of driveways that drain onto the roadway and uh, actually a good portion of County Road 58 itself winds its way, the, uh, the drainage system winds its way down some of the, uh, the back roads and uh, joins up with the uh, County Road 73 system, which then discharges to the pond. Um, so it's quite, quite a bit of stormwater that, uh, that we were responsible for, uh, for handling with the project. And we did that by uh, replacing the existing drainage structures, which were old, uh, regular concrete drainage structures that uh, had no infiltration capacity and, and we replaced them with what we refer to as leaching basins or infiltration basins which allow the uh, stormwater to uh, percolate into the surrounding ground which is you know then filters out the uh, a lot of the pollutants before they're able to reach the water body. The basic premise behind the stormwater treatment system that we chose for this project was to uh, remove sediments and floatables from the stormwater before it's discharged to the pond. At the point when the stormwater enters the treatment system, hopefully most of the dissolved pollutants have already been removed by the infiltration practices that we installed. So the purpose of this treatment system towards the end of the pipe uh, is to remove the sediments and the floatables that may still make it into the pipe. The separator system or vortex system or stormwater treatment system works by using a combination of a swirl chamber and some baffles that basically force the stormwater to flow in a certain way to take out the sediments, so the basically the, the heavy stuff that's in the stormwater, so dirt and gravel and stuff that uh, believe it or not, uh, pollutants like to attach to those sediments. And in addition, the, any floatable material will, uh, will be trapped in the chamber as well. So obviously your oils, your greases, uh, things that are typically found on the road that would get washed down the drain when it rains uh, in the stormwater runoff, in addition to larger floatables, so uh, cups and trash and that kind of debris would also be trapped in the treatment system. We wanted to make sure because the school on the road, there's a, the firehouse is on the road. And like I said, it's a major um, thoroughfare for the ambulances getting to the hospital. That during construction, that traffic would always keep flowing. It was very important that, that, that the traffic was maintained, and it was. They did a very good job. So based in, in what they did is they used the whole right-of-way, but they put in ADA-compliant sidewalks. So there's, now there's a sidewalk on both sides. Is also the shoulders are actually wider also for bicycles. So it's a much safer road. It's obviously now it's smooth and level and there's no standing water.
but the safety was a big, big concern and they really did a good job with that. So we actually finished paving the road uh, and then one week and then the following Monday we had a fairly reasonable sized rain event. It was uh, about an inch, which doesn't sound like a lot of rain, but over a drainage area of this size it ends up being a decent amount of water and the drainage system was working perfectly so we were able to actually see it in action, see all of the, uh, the water being collected and doing what it's supposed to be doing, so, so that was good to see. Over, overall, um, I feel like during construction uh, the, the residents here in Riverhead were, uh, were helpful and kind of glad to see us here working on the road um, because it has been a big problem for, for quite some time. So it was satisfying to see that reaction from people, you know, just uh, basically just glad that we're, uh, that we're taking care of this road. As the stories in this show have demonstrated, it takes a lot of collaboration between municipalities, nonprofit groups, and communities to make positive changes to our environment. The Shinnecock Indian Nation is part of this network and will now check in for an update on their coastal habitat restoration project. It's been about a year since the Department of Public Works first pumped sand from Shinnecock Bay to the west side of the Shinnecock Indian Reservation. What was a thin strip of rock and cobble is now a thriving, living ecosystem, resembling the beach that once was. The restoration has experienced a diverse set of weather events and has stood up to all of them. To date, rocks have been placed along the shore and Spartina grasses have been planted around them to help hold the sand in place. All this was done to act as a buffer to protect the beach. Mesh bags of oyster shell have been strategically placed to form an oyster reef. Live oysters will be put around the reef so that its spat can adhere to the shell and create a living oyster reef. Oysters are a filter feeder and can filter up to 50 gallons of water per day. The next phase is to plant eelgrass off the beach and create a nursery habitat for finfish and shellfish. The restoration is nearing completion and we will continue keeping you informed as to our progress. We'll keep providing updates on this impressive project, but that's all for today. If you are not able to come to the powwow this year, you can still come out and learn about the Shinnecock Indian Nation by visiting the Cultural Center and Museum. It showcases the history and culture of the nation and features artifacts and a variety of interesting native art. Thanks for watching and see you next time on the water and in the field.